appreciate all of your support here. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Ortiz could not be here today, so he sent me a message for everybody, so I'm just going to read that to begin with. Um, in the fall of 2014, the Summer Park the Oral History Program initiated the Latino Diaspora and the Americas Project, ALDA. We created ALDA to first and foremost to student demand at the University of Florida for enhanced Latino studies offerings and research and course opportunities. The Proctor Program consulted closely with colleagues at Duke University, UC Berkeley, as well as UNC, as we designed our research agenda. Our board of advisors includes Dr. Ricky Cruz, the president of the American Historical Association, as well as Dr. Carlos Munoz, the co-founder of Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley. Our first major research project in Latino Studies actually preceded the formation of ALDA. This was our collaboration with Duke University Student Action Farm Workers Program. These oral histories with alumni of SAS into the fields of migrant and agricultural internship. These oral histories became part of the Duke publication that commemorated the 20th anniversary of the Student Action Farm Workers. This initial project grounded LDAP in a great tradition of ethnic studies as a discipline concerned with civic engagement, social justice, and rigorous research. Um, we can all take great pride in the aspiring achievements of our students and that everyone they asked for the America's Research Project. At the same time, we must work together to both increase UF student Latino access to uh, Latino studies opportunities. You have currently lies behind many of our peer institutions in the Latino Studies offerings. However, this deficit need not continue. Latino Studies must be at the research of UF aspirations to become a top 10 research university. I hope that we can find ways to support the efforts of our students and the LTAP program as they create, plan to create for future research, teaching, and service projects in the growing Latino communities of Florida and beyond. I deeply regret not being able to be with you this evening due to a death in my family. I'm very proud of the work that all the students in the LDAP seminar have been mm -hmm. engaged in this year. You are seeing one outcome of this research, Latino studies. It is not an understatement to say that LDAP students have made history this year. In doing so, they have built even you know, multilingual bridges between the University of Florida border community, and they have made the university a better place for all of us to study and to understand each other. Thank you for being here this evening. Um, in addition to that, we just wanted to say that the incredible achievements that you all saw in the display that we've done this year are really a testament to this type of ethnic studies education and also the incredible support that we have from space spaces such as La Casita and IDC. We do this work because we want more of this here at the University of Florida and we also want our spaces to be protected. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce what we titled the MVP of our class. Richard Nines, who's the director of tonight's class. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Jameson Seth, my name is Richard, and I was the director for this film. And I worked with Genesis and Naive, she wasn't able to be here, but we just edited, we worked together to create this amazing art piece. And when we, because the whole thing came to fruition, or it all started back when Genesis started the class in the fall semester, I was unfortunately not part of it, but I know a lot of people that were, and the importance of it was that studies, empowerment, one's history, as well as most culture. And so throughout the semester, we interviewed a plethora of students, faculty, staff members from UF. And with that, I wanted to create a, a story of their life before UF, their life in UF, how they see themselves treated as minority students here, and how they see how UF treats um, spaces, as well as ethnic studies, and how it's represented in UF. And at the end, how we can be better. So, and then happy note. So without further notice, just get all comfortable and just enjoy the film. All right, hello, can everybody hear me? Okay, so thank you so much for watching the film. Um, before we wanted to do a Q&A panel, we kind of want to explain a little bit about the course this semester. So this course was started in the fall from the Oral History Project, and I think it's a testament to how much students want this type of education that the non-original students that we had signed up to do extra readings, extra papers, extra community projects. This wasn't something that they, that, was, that they did because they had to, but because they wanted to. And a lot of what we've been focused, at least last semester, was learning about immigration and race. So learning about um, immigration and race and social justice issues that are affecting our communities. And a big part of it is learning about these things from scholars of color. Because a big part of the class is that 
oftentimes we talk about these systems, but we don't read from people that are experiencing these things or that have experienced it. And that was a big component of our uh, course last semester. Our course was also very much based on the ethnic studies courses that were banned in Tucson that Latoya mentioned in the film. So this is the most successful high school ethnic studies program in the nation. And it took a, a school district where 50% of the students were dropping out into a 93% graduation rate. And a part of it was challenging students, making you read critically, think critically, and also being a part of your community, which is why last semester our project was to do a community development plan for immigrant families here in Gainesville. This semester, our class was based on social movements. And a, big, a lot of us were able to actually go to Tucson, Arizona to work with the people from this bound program to interview them and talk to them about their experiences. And this film is a testament to what we learned this semester and the struggles that students that want to have more ethnic studies here on campus are facing and why this knowledge is important. Because you see yourself, it empowers you, and it makes a very big difference in your life to learn about things that aren't normally taught. It makes you think critically, and also it makes you be a, like really go out there and be a part of your community, which I think is a big part that you just don't sit in the classroom and read a paper, but you actually go and engage in real life, because that's what we want to do. We want to be agents of change in our society. So before we, um, I bring up the students to answer your questions, this is a poem that they would read in Tucson before each of their classes. So um, think of the students or the guys want to stand up so we can read the poem aloud all together. <laughs> okay, so this one is called um, In La Cash, which is, is based on Mayan indigenous um, traditions, and it's called Tu Eres Mi Otro Yo. So, are you ready? And everybody say it together. Okay, so. Tu Eres Mi Otro Yo. You are my other me. Si te hago daño a ti, if I do harm to you, me hago daño a mi mismo. I do harm to myself. If I amo y respeto, if I love and respect you, me amo y respeto yo. I love and respect myself. And in essence, this is the heart of ethnic studies education and what we've been learning about this year. So um, some of the students are going to be up here in the front, and Liana's going to run with the mic. So if you want to ask the panelists a question, just raise your hand and I'll pass around the mic. It could be anything about what they experienced this past year, our trip to Tucson, Arizona, anything. And you can introduce yourself if you're a student or anything. Hi, um, I'm, I'm Jessica Taylor and I am a graduate student. Um, I was reading the Ten Commandments for a Liberated Society on the back of the thing and I think it's simply wonderful. And I was wondering if maybe... Um, you could explain a little more about number six. Um, we want our people to find purpose in life so they could realize their humanity. I think that's really beautiful, and I want to know where it came from. Okay, so... <laughs> Hi, my name is Yarelis. I'm a third-year um, English major here. And basically what number six means is that so often people of color are taught that they are less than. People of color are taught that there are boundaries and that they can't overcome them, whether it be institutional, whether it be, you know, what you take it. So then so often our purposes in life are taken from us before we even know what our purpose is. So through ethnic studies, we want our people to find their purpose. Hi, my name is Brittany Mejia. I'm a third year um, history major. Um, personally, uh, I come from a big city. I come from Miami. Um, I've seen a lot of poverty. And I've realized that people of color, um, especially when they grow up in certain situations, they don't see beyond what, what's right in front of them. So if you grow up in the project and you see drugs, you see violence, you see the police, you don't take education seriously. And when you don't take education seriously and you believe that there's a glass ceiling and that your family or yourself or your people can only go so far, you lose purpose. And you live life like you're there por pasatiempo. You are invisible. And these are so tragically the stories of human beings. We are not animals. We are agents of our society. We are agents of this world. And with education, 
we can empower these populations to believe that my life matters. I am a human. I am a mother. I am a brother. I am an educator. I am so much more than the criminal, so much more than the dropout, so much more than the person that works at McDonald's just to pay rent, you know, and it's, it's cyclical and it's ongoing and it's been happening for centuries. So ethnic studies would be the way to empower these people, give them purpose and allow them to believe that their possibilities are endless. Anyone else want to answer that question? All right, any other questions? Um, so great job. I really enjoyed the documentary. You all did such a really beautiful job um, explaining the issues. Um, I was just wondering, how do you, you get this information outside of the echo chamber? Because a lot of the people here I know are really involved in the social justice struggle at UF through different capacities. So how do we get it outside of this community? Oh, I'm Derek. I'm a graduating senior. Hi, everyone. My name is Brittany Hibbert. Um, I am a senior of history here. I'll be walking the seat finally. Um, I think because we have this exposure to this information, we have to make sure that we're doing the legwork to get this out. Um, we're doing an injustice to the, st the students here, our fellow Gators. Um, to the younger people who will be getting here and everyone that comes after us if we don't go out and tell these stories. So being students of the oral history program here and having all the, the resources that we do, we're doing a disservice to ourselves if we've you know, been trained by people like Dr. Ortiz and all of his amazing staff and family that's up there. If we don't use this training that we've gotten and told the stories that we were trained to tell, then we are not doing what we set out to do. So by having you guys here and talking to you and, and sharing our story with you, we hope that you see this information that was here and take that with you and say, hey, you know, I just saw a student-made documentary about ethnic studies and I learned something that I did not know. Um, here on the boards behind you, we also have some more information. If you take a second to look there, you can see um, the bill that was in Tucson. Um, you know, there's so much information, but we have to do the legwork. Um, a lot of us that are up here, actually all of us that are up here, we represent a, a minority within our own communities, even though we are seen as minorities because we have yearned for this information. We did not accept what was hand given to us and say, okay, this is all that was there. We already knew that something was up. So we did our own legwork individually and said, hey, Dr. Ortiz, we need this class. Hey, Genesis, we wanna be in this class for another semester even though we're done with our history credits and, and everything else. So we did the legwork and, and now because we share it with you and everyone else, we hope that you guys are gonna do the same thing. But we all understand our responsibilities as future politicians, educators, you know, lawyers, all the things that we want to do personally, we understand that the job does not stop here. It doesn't stop when we walk across the orange carpet and we get a chop for the last time. We understand that this is a lifelong duty. And we hope by you guys coming in here and seeing our documentary that you understand that you too now have a responsibility to go to your friends and your siblings and everyone else and let them know what you've seen here. Because we can't tell the story alone, but we hope that you will help us tell it to everyone. Um... I think that we don't always explore the importance and the significance of dialogue. So there's intergenerational dialogue. There needs to be a dialogue between our communities. There needs to be a dialogue all the time. If we don't talk about this, if we don't get this information out, no one's going to know about it. There's a reason that classes are structured a certain way. I mean, they're state funded. There's certain things that they want you to know, and there's certain things that they don't want you to know, and there's certain things that make people uncomfortable. But as a minority, if you're in a class and you're the only person of color, you're going to be uncomfortable as well. So we cannot uh, continue to make things comfortable for other people. We have to have this conversation with every person that we come in contact with. Because this is our university, this is our country, and this is our problem. And no one's going to fix it for us. So ultimately, using social media and using the power of your voice, that is what's going to raise social consciousness and ultimately make change. Yes, yes, of course. Um, hi, my name is Jake Odeo Teran. I'm a third year sociology major. Um, and I think Brittany and Brittany both hit on great <laughs> Um, points is raising hell, like 
your silence is indifference and you're, you're perpetuating the system of oppression. Um, so in order, you know, to get this out, because a lot of people here are interested in these topics, right? A lot of people here are educated on these topics. So the best way I think to get this knowledge out there is by raising hell in those comfortable spaces. When you're learning your U.S. history, question your professor. Question your white professor as to why he's teaching you ethnocentrism. Why is he not teaching you about the enslavement or the concentration camps of the Japanese or of the, of the slavery or the raping of, of um, slave women? Um, question, be critical of everything that's U.S. history because there's a lot of things that are missing. And ask why those things are missing. So instead of being comfortable, make things uncomfortable because your, your comfortability is basically you perpetuating the cycle of oppression and continuing the cycle of U.S. whitewashed history. Um, these stories, you know, as Brittany said, we demanded these things. Like the Institute of, like, the Institute of Hispanic Latino Cultures, the IBC, you know, um, APIA as a minor, uh, Latin American Studies as a minor. Like these things were demanded and we raised our voices to get them. We didn't sit there in silence letting these things get given to us, you know. So I think the best way to get this message across is by literally using your voice as your biggest weapon and raising hell and making people so uncomfortable that you get things done. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I need the mic either. Can everybody give me the mic? It makes me kind of uncomfortable. So piggyback, so piggyback off of what Jay said, nothing is going to be handed to you. This was made explicit. These things were fought for. You need to be comfortable with making other people uncomfortable, with having conversations. When you hear someone say something that isn't right, whether, you know, like those racist jokes, be like, hey, why do you, why do you say that? Why do you think that? And the other thing is that there isn't currently a space other than the IBC and La Casita where conversations like that can take place. When I first started learning about ethnic studies, it was at La Casita. So you're not going to find classes like these in the mainstream curriculum. You're not going to find yourself represented. So as Jay was saying, raise hell for them. Don't let them ignore you. Don't let them ignore you because you've been ignored for 500 years. It's time to make it soft. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other comments? Question. Um, this is a great project. Um, I'm kind of curious um, of you know when you were coming into the class and after what you felt you learned personally. And another question that I have as well is I don't think I see any VPs here. Um, how would you voice that so that they listen? So vice presidents or you know, the new president, or the new president, yeah. Okay, so. Oh, okay, so the camera, speaking for the camera. So then the question, so that I know is like, how did we feel coming into the class and then coming out of it, and how would we raise our voices to the VP? Or to any other, yeah, administration. So coming into this class was, I was extremely excited. There wasn't a course like this before. You know, like, where is it that you can learn about Cesar Chavez? Where is it that you can really have a talk about what it means to be an immigrant in this country, what it means to be first gen, what it means to never have seen yourself in movies in terms of, like, being portrayed as a United Station, because I refuse to say American when you're talking about the U.S. because American is a continent, um, a United Station hero, right? You know, what does it feel like when you have your little brother saying, Yarelis, like, where am I? So then coming into this class and being able to learn that the first Latino mayor actually happened in the 1800s and not in the late 1900s was something incredibly empowering. You know, I cannot tell you the number of times that we all sat together and cried because we were finally learning about ourselves. So walking out of the class, I could walk with my head held high. And for, you know, how do you raise your voices to a VP? Remember that you are a student. And as a student, you have an incredible amount of power. And <laughs> yeah, you know. You are basically the backbone of this institution, whether you realize it or not. So 
you know, what are some of the ways that you can make the VPs listen? Petition. Pressure them. Sit in, teach in. Email. Do the Seru survey. Everybody hates the Seru survey, but that is where they get their information from. So do the Seru survey. Please. <laughs> and I will say, um, I'm Dominican. My whole entire family is Dominican. I'm the first and only person from my family that was born in the United States. And I knew absolutely nothing. Like, I knew everything about American history coming to the University of Florida. Well, not everything, but I knew I knew too much. I knew a lot. Um, but I knew nothing about my country. I knew nothing about my people. I knew nothing about my history. I didn't understand the politics. I didn't know why the situation was just so messed up. Like, I did not understand it. And having a class like this that allowed me to not only look at my history here in the United States, but look at the history that has happened in my country, um, it has, it has fulfilled my hunger for knowledge in a way that I cannot put into words. There is nothing more empowering than knowing where you come from, what has happened, what has transpired, what has been all of the, the repercussions of those events and, and how it all relates to me and, and what I can do not only to educate myself but to use this knowledge to empower this generation and the next generation and how I can be an active participant and go back to my country and tell my people, like, look, like, I'm in the United States, but I still care. I still know, and I know that together we can change. I honestly, I could care less about administration. I could care less of whether or not they, they think it's important. Really, what we need is funding. Really, what we need is students to be aware, to attend, to feel like things like this are important. That's what we need because if we have the numbers, they can't ignore us. If we have the numbers, they're going to show up because they're going to want to know what's going on. So it's all about information. Getting the information for personal use and then using that information to tell other people so we can earn it. To be honest, what I've learned the most in this class is the love um, for myself, you know, for Mirasa, for my people. Not, not this comparing myself to ethnocentrism, you know? I'm not European, I'm not Caucasian, I'm not white, I'm Latino, and I'm proudly Latino. And I, through this class, I've learned to be proudful and prideful and, you know, so culturally aware and just love, you know? Like, that's something that I think us as minority students lack in representation. Because oftentimes what we are taught aren't ourselves. What we're taught is what we should compare ourselves to, which isn't, isn't possible because at the end of the day, we're not white. We're never going to be white. Um, and so I think also the best thing that we can do to get administration to hear these things is not be afraid. I think oftentimes when we have conversations with administration, we're afraid because they have that you know, seat of power. Um, and I think using our voices, how we've been saying, like raising hell, like literally we're giving them their daily checks. Um, so at the end of the day saying, why am I not getting this? I'm paying this amount of money, but why is it not being represented in what I'm studying and what I'm getting and what are the, what resources I am given? Hello. Okay. So as Genesis said before, I'm Richard, and I am a biology major, third year. And because I am a biology major, um, I really didn't have the uh, experience or had to take the classes that were related to the ethnic studies or any kind of studies here in UF. And so it was until this semester, I said from La Casita, where I learned so much that I really learned about my culture and everything related to it. And you could say that if a year ago you were told me about being Latino, I would say, yeah, I'm Latino and I'm proud of it, but I wouldn't really go into it and why. But during this semester, I've learned the various aspects that come within my culture as well as being right of my culture. And it has allowed me to show and embody my culture to the outside world. And so I think that's one of the things that I'm grateful for in the class. And I can't wait to just go on and move on and still learn more about it 
because as, again, because this is my first class in ethnic studies or any kind of study, I just um, would call myself as a new deal, something like. And then to just raise awareness to the other people, it's important to, that you just care enough yourself, and then that would translate ultimately to them. But if you don't care enough, how would they care? Okay, um, really quickly, because I know this question we're all answering this um, one way or another, but um, I'll just say this. When you look at me, you know right off the bat that I don't look like your regular American, when we use that term. Um, you know that I wasn't born here. And for so long, it bothered me when people would um, mistake me for a Mexican. They'd be like, oh, you're Mexican. Oh, you're Chicana. And I would tell them, no, I'm, I'm, I'm from Guatemala. Um, we're right below. I'm, I'm a neighbor, but, but, um, but I'm not from there. And after going through this whole, this, my entire college experience has been, um, I want to say it's, I've learned more personally and about myself than I have um, academically, and I feel like that's important as well, because I can continue my academics later on, I can go to grad school and do all those things, but to take the time to learn about yourself is extremely special, and it's something that not many people do. And if you, you know, in the audience or us um, here on, on the panel have had that time, have given yourself that time to experience that personal growth, that's exceptional. And I, and, and I congratulate you for doing that and for taking those steps. And if you haven't, I encourage you to. Um, but to get back to, to the way I look, um, this is the last time that a lot of us are going to be here together physically uh, before we do a reunion in 10 years or something and we see where we've come and, you know, who we've married and what our kids look like and, and everything. Um, and, yes, I am getting emotional about this. But... Um, at this point in my life, I am so proud of the way I look and the fact that I'm, I'm unique, I'm different. Yes, I look like an indigenous princess, but okay, fantastic, I look like an indigenous princess. Like, I would much rather look that way than look like something off, you know, a stock photo. I don't want to look like that. So, um, so yeah, so that's the one way that I've, that I've personally changed my life. guys. My name is Brittany again, one of the two in the class. Um, and for me, um, I'm not Latino. And um, I didn't know any of them before this class. And Genesis was a good friend of mine. And, um, you know, they were trying to have a, a child run for the first um, class that we did last semester. And it wasn't, it was only considered um, an IDS course. So it wasn't even officially a history course. Um, and now this is my family. This is, this is my family. And um, in this course, I, like I said, I was a history major, and I've learned so much about everybody else's history. I can tell you about, you know, certain events in European history. I can tell you about some things that have gone on in Mexico. Um, I only was able to take two African-American history courses out of the million that I had to take to graduate. And in this course was the first time that I was able to look at African-American people and Latino people working together on the same feet. And if you were to ask a, a, a normal person on the road if they understood that, that our journeys have been together and not separated, they would not have known that. And for me to be able to sit here and, and, you know, now pick up on some words in Spanish because they have a Spanglish thing that they have to do for me and translating things. Um, and, it, it, you know, the, the, the setup of the class really, I didn't feel isolated. I never felt like I was the other in the class, even though I was the only black woman that was in the class among my peers. It was never an issue. It was never, oh, you know, well, we, we need to make sure we have this in here because, you know, Brittany's in the class. Everything that I learned is just as relevant to me as it is to my brothers and sisters that are up here with me. And I think that's very important because you might put another student in the class and they might see a separation. They might say, well, you're the only black student in the class. What did you get from it? I got the same thing that they got. I learned to take time to sit down and look at a piece of, of a literature, read a poem or hear a song and think, okay, well, why does this mean something to me? Why did my professor ask me to read this piece of literature in class today? Why is this relevant to the lesson that I'm learning today? And one thing that I'm very thankful that Genesis um, made available to us was time for reflection in every class. So it wasn't go home and read 30 pages and then come back in class and never talk about them. And then it shows up on the final exam and it's a, you know, it's a paper that you have to write. It was no, you actually had to read it and we had to have time to stop and think. 
And I was the one at the end of every class when Genesis would give us our, you know, reflection activity. I'm like, Genesis, there's no tissue in here. We're going to start crying. Like, why, why do you do this to us every time we come in here every Monday? And that's what our classes were like. We learned some things that we have not, would have never, like, it wouldn't have been possible without Genesis. And you have to have somebody who cares just as much about what you are doing, whether they look like you or not. You, you need that. And I don't know if any of you want to get an education or even in your own majors, look for a way that you can create these spaces. Think about the deficit you may have in your own education where you know everything about everyone else and you know nothing about yourself. That's a problem. And, you know, so coming into this class, I was, you know, the same girl was expressive, but I learned how to relate to the people around me by giving them a, a chance to, to talk about what they needed to and really listen, actively listening. And we've bumped heads as the scholars that we are about everything. We've talked about Malcolm X. We've talked about the Young Lords, Dr. King. We've, we've talked about everything that you would never expect anyone to teach in any other class we were able to learn about in here. And we pushed ourselves emotionally. You know, we knew Genesis was going to push us academically because that is what she does. Um, and, you know, it, so the class, it, I have never had an experience like that in my time here at the University of Florida ever. And if you have a chance to take a course like that, you know, hopefully there'll be something that's still here when, we're, when we all leave. But please understand and know that this class is much, I wouldn't even consider it a class. Like, this is probably going to be, like, really emotional when we're all finished because it was much more than reading and writing papers and, and doing group projects. Like, this is a family. And please know that learning about each of our histories is the only reason why we know each other the way we do. Because we had to have real conversations with each other to really understand what it was Genesis wanted us to learn. And she likes to, she has her mind games and she wants you to, like, put together the articles and stuff, and at the end of each class, we literally came out of the class like, man, I never knew that. Like, that's crazy. I learned so much. So, I don't know. I just, we're just, I think we're all just very grateful for the experience, and it was life-changing both semesters, this semester, being able to travel with each other and go to Arizona and cry there, and having to see grown men and, and teachers cry and remembering being separated from their students. So mean people that we write about. Like, we got so mean people that yeah. we find yeah. I, I sat down with a girl who her mom was on the front lines with her when she was doing like sit-ins in front of like this government building during the whole debacle. Like her mom was right there next to her. Her mom was the one who wrote her a slip so she could open the gate so all the kids could like walk out of class. Her mom was the one who was grabbed by the hair and kneed in the back by a police officer while her body was flung by another police officer. Imagine you seeing a police officer grabbing your mom by the hair and flaring her around, a grown man to your mother, that's one of those things where it's like, there's a reason why history is provocative. There's a reason why history is dangerous. History is dangerous because it can be manipulated. And anything that can be manipulated can be used for anyone's agenda. If you learn about things that make you mad, that make you uncomfortable, that it's just like, how in the world can anyone do that? How can anyone watch and let that happen? And this isn't, this isn't a single isolated event with one or two people. This is society. This, is, this has been going on forever. And it's like, we can continue to let it happen. And you know, we got Obama. And, Everything's gonna be all right, and ultimately, everything's gonna be exactly how we want it to, or we fight for it, we take it, and we be like, this is how we want it. That's, I think that's a good point to make, only because if we look at it like, you know, we have the, the, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement that's going on right now, but everything that we're learning, is, I could say the same thing about Latino lives, because I know the spotlight is on one group of people right now, but it's happening in, in their neighborhood as well, with their community. So many, so, there's so many, yeah. um, sorry, there's so many, there's, there's so many intersectionalities, and there's so many people that get murdered by the Mexican border that weren't even trying to cross. And they get killed and no one knows about it. And this is going on every day. So what do we do? Do we just let them die? Do we just let mothers watch their sons die after having them in their stomach for nine months and feeding them all their lives? Okay, so Allison, do you want to say something? We're going to take one more question and we're going to wrap it up. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jocelyn. And I'll be honest. Um, when I first started the class, I didn't really know what to expect. I just knew that I was excited. Um, but throughout my time here as a student, I don't think I've ever been as challenged mentally as I have in this class. Um, this class is all about self-reflection. So every day it was either a question of 
you know, how do I see myself as a Latina? Um, how do I see that play into my daily life? How do I identify myself? Why do I identify myself the way I do? Um, why do I act the way I do? And how do I feel in certain settings? Um, and the most important thing to me this year for in fall and spring was how, um, I guess, how this class translated into my life. Um, Everything I learned in this class was taken into action this past semester and last fall. So this past semester, um, as you all know, there was an Access Party a campaign. And what we learned in fall and spring was taken into that campaign. And we did it together as a community of students. Um, and like this class like has I don't know, it's really hard to put this class into words, right? Because I think we each have such a personal connection to what this class has taught us. Um, and every day I, I'm still challenged by Genesis. Um, she, made, like, she made me write something about like 10 years from now, like where would I see myself and what I would like to say that I've given back to. And you know, these are tough questions. Like what teacher has ever asked you of this? I'm only 20 years old, right? Like, how am, I, how am I supposed to know what 10, 20 years from now I'm supposed to be doing? But I think these are extremely critical questions to who we are as human beings and how we want to take our life forward. Um, and for me personally, especially in when we took a class trip to Arizona, um, I don't think I've ever cried as much as I have um, <laughs> as that trip, and, you know, we did it together. But the reason why I was so emotional I mean, and for me specifically, was because at times, as people of color and as minorities, we are taught to hide who we are. Um, and I can say, like, multiple times, I have hidden who I am as an individual to fit in. Especially now in this new journey I'm embarking in, I have to remember and keep myself grounded to who I am as a person and that no one can take my voice away a student's voices away. Um, and this class is extremely critical, I believe, to helping each of us as individuals be grounded into who we are and where we come from. Because what this class showed me is how far my community or people of color minorities have come or how far I have come and how far I still have to go. This is just part of the journey. And if anything, what this class did for me as an individual was you know, put that fire under myself to say, Jocelyn, you're going to continue to fight. You know, my, my fight, our struggle isn't over. And it just gave us the strength to continue. Um, and I think classes like these are extremely important because, like how we all have said, it's the first time that we could leave from a class saying, I learned about myself today. Whether it's personally, whether it's history, we learned something. Um, and it wasn't just through education, it was a personal learning experience. And I think that's what's so important about ethnic studies is because they finally relate education to who you are individually as a person. And to me as a student, I've never really received that until this class. And I think it's still hard for me to put into words what this class means to me because it's been an entire year of being constantly challenged every day um, and I think we all needed that, you know. Uh, <laughs> I needed it. You know, we constantly need to be challenged and to be reminded of why we are here um, and what we want to do in this world. So I still ask myself every day, what do I want to do in my time here? You know, like, what do I want to say that I want, that I accomplished? Who do I want to say that I represented? Who do I want to say that I have helped? And I think this class, helps you provide those answers because it empowers you to find those answers within yourself. Not because someone else is telling you, but because you have found those answers within yourself as an individual. So much pressure being like the last question it has to be really, really good. Um, I don't know if it's gonna be or not, but my name is Randy. I'm a PhD student in the English department. Um, I have a comment and then a question. I think the beautiful thing about um, what you guys have done here and talking and in the documentary is it really 
um, dissolves that barrier between scholarship and activism. Everyone up here seems to be very much invested in activism. Um, and as a scholar myself, I think that's what we need more and more scholars who not only want to do work for tenure, but do work for and in communities. Um, and so my question to anyone on the panel was more of an imaginative question. Um, there's been a lot of talk about institutionalization, funding, and things like that, which I think is important, but I also think, as we all are aware, you know, universities, the canonization of knowledge, even the production of knowledge sometimes is often complicit in these systems of colonialism, slavery, neoliberalism, et cetera. So I want to ask the people on the panel, what would an ethnic studies um, curriculum perspective, um, just basic, you know, view of the world look like detached from the university? Okay, so when we were in Tucson, we actually met a young man who had graduated from the MASS program, and he brought it back to the community through this program called Flowers and Bullets. And essentially what it is, it's like an agricultural program where you go in and you learn how to, like, you know, feed yourself. And these were all things that he had learned in the MASS program. So then that is what I think a perfect idea of what an ethnic studies detached from an institution looks like. An individual going back to his community and teaching them, you know, translatable skills to not only survive, but to say, hey, you want to know what? Once upon a time, your ancestors grew this. So I'm also going to, like, try to let Brittany answer you. Can I be quick? Um, honestly, growing up, I feel like as a woman of color, I did not have any role models. I didn't have any strong woman that I can look up to and aspire to be. I feel that we need to make a new way. I think that by us educating ourselves, by being active in our communities, we can go back and allow the younger generation to open their eyes and realize that we are people of substance. We are people who are resilient, we are resistant. We, by allowing younger people to have role models, to have people who aren't, you know, their focus isn't, you know, pop culture or style of dress, but actual substance, that would create a society that would be substantial, that would create a society that would understand the importance of getting their education, of going back into the community, so I feel, I feel that detached from an from an institution, we need to serve as role models. Um, and so I think what ethnic studies does is that it inspires students and individuals to be enactors of change. And a concrete example of that would be last semester. You know, we it was made very clear to us that we have to take everything we learned in classes to our community. So how would we take what we learned back to the community here in Gainesville? And I feel oftentimes, as students, we kind of only see the University of Florida as our home, and we don't realize that there's a greater community at large. So, you know, we volunteered on a weekly by weekly basis, um, and we taught English to um, immigrants in Gainesville community. And we also created a project um, to aid migrant families. And it was all because we understood that as students, we are not the only like benefactors of this knowledge. We have to take everything we have learned and take it back to people, like, because, for example, like, we, like, we understand that we are privileged to be receiving an education. And because of that, we have to make sure that then others are also benefiting. Because um, we, the whole world is a community. So how am I, as a human being, gonna help the person next to me and behind me move forward with me. And I think this is what this class in ethnic studies teaches individuals, is that you take the people next to you and behind you forward as you move forward. Um, and yeah, I think the concrete example would be, if you see one of those things here, you'll see a resource guide that is a class we created for the Gainesville community. We also um, created, I guess, an outline of what ethnic studies would look like at a high school education level for civic engagement. Um, you know, because all of this is possible. 
And it's just making sure that as students, we feel empowered to take this knowledge back to those around us. Well, what I was just um, gonna say, I think, <laughs> no, 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 you're fine. Like on a more practical level, we already have ethnic studies as separated from a university because we can create these spaces in our churches, we can create these spaces in our after school programs, we can create these spaces when we go to step practice, you go to karate practice, um, you have younger siblings, you can facilitate these conversations. The conversation is where it starts because Genesis started a conversation with us and now we're having it with you. So we don't need a building to do that. We can sit outside in the grass every day for an hour and have this conversation and you will see ethnic studies growing. So we already, we're already enabled and empowered to do this, but you have to have the will for it. So once we sit down and get this information, every single person in here can help us push ethnic studies, whether you look like us or not. So we don't, you know, it's, it's already separated from the university. Once we get information, all we have to do is sit down and make sure someone else hears it. It's as simple as having a conversation with somebody who maybe never, you know, they've never met you before, or they didn't understand what it meant to be Latino or Latina or whatever it is. So once you have the conversation with someone, there's already a separation from ethnic studies from a university. So we just have to be practitioners of that. We have to say exactly, we have to do what we've been talking about. Okay, so I guess we'll close it here. Um, I just wanted to say, and to conclude, but these very, very articulate students have all said for the past half hour is, this semester especially, it was a social movement class. So we learned a lot about movements that have happened from, you know, starting from the Haitian Revolution, to the Young Lords, to the Black Lives Matter movement. And I feel like this year for us has kind of been like a guerrilla warfare type of year. Because, like they said, every single thing that we have, like this thing, we had to fight for everything. There were people that weren't on our side, things that were very difficult. I've never taught a class before. Like, we all basically banded together to make this happen. And, you know, sometimes I'd be, you know, kind of scared to go into class and have them do certain things or demand certain things of them because I'll look at Brittany, she'll give me that face. And it's a lot because we've all had a written papers, we've all had to take exams, but that, why we did this class is because it's, how many times really have you had to think about yourselves and the identity that has been forced on you? Like Natalia said, like we're constantly being told who we are, what we have to be, what we have to listen to, what we have to read. So how many times have we taken the opportunity to define for ourselves who we are and the future that we needed to create for ourselves? And we don't get the opportunity a lot. And I think that's what we wanted to do this semester is learn about us and create a future that we want with integrity. So like in the program, those 10 commandments that you guys see there, that was what we did on our last class on Monday. It was 40 years from now, what do you want to have dedicated your life to have fought for? What do you want your legacy to be, your struggle to be? And those are the, what we came up with. And I think it's a testament to the incredible work that we have done this year. I think, and I think what's really special about this class is that we have all known each other for like three or four years now in and out of each other's lives. And we came together at this year. And I don't think that was a coincidence. I don't believe that. I believe things happen for a reason. We all came together at this moment, at this time. And what we did this year was incredible. And we did it together. And I think this knowledge doesn't go away. The class, in one semester, made it an official course here at UF. And you have spaces like IBC and I guess that you can protect them and keep this stuff going. So it doesn't end here. We have to keep fighting for it. Um, and another thing I want to say is we really want to thank everybody that was interviewed and that uh, basically worked with us this whole semester. People like Rafa, Dr. Garcia, who left, Randy, people that Anthony, who designed every single thing that LDAP does, Anthony has designed. We would not be here without Anthony. <laughs> so I feel like this, everybody has, we're only here also because we have an amazing community here on campus that has supported us. And that's a big part of it. We're a family because we have this amazing group of people here that also support and help us. They're our veteranos, and we're only here because of them. So we want to thank you very much for coming out. And we'll have all this up on YouTube very soon so you can share it and spread it, and we can continue this dialogue. <laughs> thank you. You have been with me since I was a freshman. You have been with a lot of us from the beginning, and you are one of our veterans. And, you know, this would not have been possible without this woman of vision, this woman of power. It would not have happened at all. And I am so glad that you're going to graduate school because I know that you're going to do amazing things. And, you know, it would be a dishonor if we don't continue your work.